So the organizers have asked me to introduce our lunchtime keynote speaker, and so I'm very happy to take on that uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, Professor Will Bode of University of Chicago Law School. I first met Will when he was still, a, he went to, he didn't actually go to law school, he went to Yale, um, and that was when I first met him, uh, and he was applying for clerkships, so uh, it may be that the most important thing I've ever done in my life was hire him as a law clerk and thus set him on his path to future glory. Uh, he then clerked for the Chief Justice and has been uh, teaching at University of Chicago pretty much ever since and is uh, like everybody's favorite uh, law professor. So here he is. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Uh, I still have... Uh, bad dreams sometimes about the initial clerkship interview in which I uh, somehow thought it was a good idea to try to convince a, a sitting federal judge that uh, there would be a right to buy cocaine in public schools uh, if there should be public schools. Uh, but somehow we got over that. The uh, original draft of this talk was going to be called uh, Beyond Public Meaning Originalism. But of course, as we've been talking about lots of things during this conference related to what I want to talk about, I've had to change a lot of things and possibly make the title uh, Bruin as Bodesaxianism, uh, which will be a, a big piece of what I'm going to talk about today. So <clears throat> one of the things Michael said at our uh, yesterday was that the court makes a lot of use of history and tradition. I'm enjoying the musical backdrop, too. Uh, <clears throat> the court makes a lot of use of history and tradition, but it's not always clear what the theory is. If you were here for the beginning of the conference in the first panel, you know that I do have a theory. Uh, so you may have heard my initial spiel, which I apologize for having to repeat a little bit of now. Uh, but instead of talking about liquidation, I'm going to talk about originalism and the Supreme Court and whether it's doing it well. First, we have to talk about originalism. There are one major theory of originalism, uh, probably the major theory of originalism, is something called public meaning originalism. This is not the theory of originalism to which I subscribe. Uh, it's put forth most powerfully by professors Randy Barnett and Larry Solom, and they have a new article talking about a lot of the same things I'm gonna talk about now. Originalism after Dobbs, Bruin and Kennedy, the role of history and tradition, where they talk about, complain about, and sort of try to sympathetically reconstruct how the court can use the kinds of historical and traditional arguments it uses there, how is that consistent with a form of originalism that focuses on the original public meaning of the constitutional text. Um, it's hard. It's hard to explain how to use all other things that, that those cases are using if you think that originalism is mostly about the original meaning of the, uh, the public meaning of the, of the text. That is not my view. I don't think it's the most helpful view. Uh, I think the right way to think about originalism, as I said before, is as a claim about law, <clears throat> that the official story of our legal system is that our law begins at the founding, that our law is the founder's law as it has been lawfully changed. This, of course, includes the constitutional text and the ways in which the constitutional text has been amended through Article 5, but it includes more than that. It includes the surrounding legal rules and legal principles that existed in unwritten law at the time, uh, and it includes the forms of unwritten legal change that have happened over time, so long as those are pedigreed to the founding itself. And I think this way of thinking about originalism is going to be a more useful and a more fruitful way to think of what the Supreme Court is doing now. <clears throat> so, one brief aside uh, about why think about originalism in this way as a matter of unwritten law rather than as a matter of, of public meaning. I think the people who think about originalism in terms of public meaning tend to be textualists, uh, a label I sometimes use and I like, but that I worry can be incomplete and misleading. Textualism, as I've written elsewhere, uh, reflects an important insight, an insight central to the structure of our government and central to the fabric of our law uh, as it has evolved in our legal system, that the job of an interpreter, let's call her a judge, is usually to enforce rules that come from someplace else and not to make the rules herself and not to imagine rules that were never actually made law anywhere. And that insight is an important reason for textualism, but it doesn't necessarily stop at textualism. Because if we're going to honor the basic structure of our government and of our own legal order, 
we're sometimes going to need to think more deeply about the jurisprudential insights that underlie textualism. The problem is that the text itself, even the text read in its original context, is incomplete. It gives incomplete and misleading answers to important questions about the law, and it requires attention to our entire legal framework, because our legal system relies not just on written texts, but also on unwritten law. So we need to supplement textualism with unwritten law, which governs both interpretation and background principles against which interpretation takes place. That still involves remembering that the interpreter is to enforce rules that come from someplace else and not make them herself, but through unwritten law and not just uh, the text itself. Now, there was a motion earlier in the conference, I think, to relabel this view, Bode-Saxianism. And while I am pretty bad at titles and labels, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, so I prefer to call it original law originalism. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to supplement this with one more general claim before I talk about a couple cases, uh, or one more s interpretive claim, which is something else you'll find in forthcoming work that I have with Judd Campbell and Steve Sachs. This is a claim about the way unwritten law, in fact, informs the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, start with the 14th Amendment and its infamously debated Privileges or Immunities Clause. What is the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause? What are the Privileges or Immunities of Citizens of the United States? As we argue, after canvassing a lot of the options and trying to understand the historical context of the 14th Amendment, the, 14, the Privileges or Immunities Clause secures unwritten general law rights the kind of rights that would have been easily understood in a pre-Erie versus Tompkins world, where they still had a uh, brooding omnipresence in the sky, the kinds of rights that were recognized as background principles in state constitutional law used to inform the interpretations of federal statutes and so on. Uh, and these unwritten rights were taken, plucked by the Privileges and Immunities Clause and given a form of constitutional protection. Uh, and on this picture, what the, what the 14th Amendment did was not so much create new substantive rights as jurisdictional. It protected a set of unwritten common law pre-existing rights against the powers of government to abridge them. Uh, and while this, these kinds of ideas about the, the Constitution sort of securing unwritten rights without conferring them may seem very odd today, this was a routine aspect of rights enforcement and jurisprudence in the 19th century when the 14th Amendment was adopted. Americans understood the general law to place implicit bounds on the otherwise open-ended powers of state legislatures limits that could even be enforced by courts of competent jurisdiction, sometimes including federal courts. This also helps understand the relationship of the Privileges or Immunities Clause to Article 4, uh, as Privileges and Immunities Clause, and indeed to many of the Bill of Rights themselves. As we've talked about in some of the previous panels, many of the rights in the Bill of Rights were themselves pre-existing legal rights known in a sense to the common law, and part of what the part, maybe, maybe all, maybe not all, of what the Bill of Rights did was to take those pre-existing rights and secure them against the newly created federal government. So to understand any of the parts of the Constitution that we now argue about a lot, you actually have to understand a lot about the, the unwritten legal backdrop. You have to immerse yourself in the common law world, the pre-Erie world. Now, <clears throat> the Sup U.S. Supreme Court would be an unlikely place to look for a bunch of justices who have successfully immersed themselves in the pre-Erie world, all of them having uh, been born and gone to law school in the post-Erie world, and having so far shown no signs of, of shame or interest in reconsidering Erie and the jurisprudential revolution it's brought with us. But when I look at the court's uses of history and tradition and the way it tries to understand rights in some of its most recent cases, uh, I start to think that maybe somehow, somehow they've gotten a glimpse of that pre-Erie world. And some of the things they're doing are actually better explained by original law, originalism, and indeed the general law uh, than they are by other theories. So we have a panel coming up on the 14th Amendment, so I don't want to talk too much about Dobbs. Uh, and in some ways, I don't think it presents the hardest questions for originalism, so I'll just say a couple of things. Obviously, Dobbs involves many interesting questions about precedent, uh, to which I'll return in a few minutes. Uh, but the interpretive part of Dobbs works largely within the framework of a case called Washington versus Luxburg that says that unenumerated rights under the 14th Amendment, currently under the substantive due prospect, process aspect of the due process clause, are to be based in our nation's history and traditions. Uh, that's a doctrinal test about which there's relatively little interesting to say from a sort of originalist, original law framework. But there are two interesting things to say. First, 
Dobbs goes out of its way to acknowledge the Privileges or Immunities Clause and to note that that might be a better home for a lot of the case law it's reaching and would, uh, this goes out of its way to note that thinking about things in a Privileges or Immunities Clause lens would reach the same result. So footnote 22, sure to enter the pantheon of famous footnotes uh, and Supreme Court opinions, I hope. Uh, after describing at length the court's holding under the Due Process Clause, says, this is true regardless of whether we look to the amendment's due process clause or its privileges or immunities clause. It notes that some scholars and justices have maintained the privileges or immunities clause is the part of the 14th Amendment that guarantees substantive rights, uh, citing uh, Akhil Amar, John Hart Ely, and my predecessor in office, William Krosky, and saying that even on that view, such a right would need to be rooted in the nation's history and traditions, citing Corfield versus Coriel, which in turn contains a lot of the fundamental rights and general law principles that underlie the general law approach. That's interesting. Uh, second, I just note that in general, the Glucksberg test is pretty much consistent with what the general law approach to the 14th Amendment might well require. It looks to a kind of uh, nationwide custom and practice over time, the same kinds of things that unwritten common law and general law looked to, to ground rights in the 19th century. And so even some of the, the controversial, methodologically controversial parts of Dobbs, like looking to, to later practices, not just in 1868, might well make sense on something like a, a general law approach, where in theory, over time, uh, customs could eventually, could eventually evolve if sufficiently rooted uh, in, the kinds of, in the kinds of customs that create law. So I think that's interesting to see that, that Dobbs at least has, has glimpses of that, that general law perspective that may be accidental, I'm not sure, um, but it's worth noting. <coughs> All right, the other case, which I fear has been misunderstood and frequently uh, improperly maligned, is the court's Second Amendment decision in Bruin. We've already had a panel about this case, and uh, much of which addresses the consequences, the merits, some of the specific historical claims in Bruin. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with a lot of those things, but I think it's important to, to pay attention to the decision's methodology and to see a more sympathetic way to understand what Justice Thomas is struggling to tell us and why we ought to try to hear it. Uh, all right, <clears throat> so part of the problem with Bruin is that it's just a giant dump of historical sources uh, stretching across many centuries with no obvious theory about what the court is looking at, as uh, Daryl said earlier about you know why some sources are too old and some are too new and some are too small and some are too big and so on. Um, and that's, that's a very fair point. And some of this, the justices tell us, just comes from the fact that they haven't agreed on a theory. Right, so just the spirit writes a concurring opinion, just noting that there are a bunch of important questions about interpretation that the decision hasn't resolved, and I take it their solution was just to dump in all of the sources that might matter to any theory and tell us that it, that it didn't matter. Um, and so she uh, gives us a long list of, you know, what is the framework for analyzing this historical materials? Is it liquidation, tradition, or precedent? Uh, what are the permissible uses of history? How long can we use subsequent practice to illuminate original public meaning? Can practice settle the meaning of individual rights and not just structural provisions and so on? Um, so that's just a, a real world drafting problem you face when you try to do constitutional methodology by committee. It's fair enough to, to criticize it and hope the court will eventually zero in on something else. But what the court does do, it's sort of infamous uh, analogies approach, I think is actually very close to the right track and just put in a somewhat confusing way uh, for a reason that I'll try to explain. So what does Bruin do first? <clears throat> first, Bruin reiterates the central uh, and important jurisprudential holding of Heller, that the Second Amendment codifies not a new right, but a pre-existing right. That's how Heller justified looking not just to the central militia-related purposes that existed at the time the Second Amendment was written, but to the purposes of the pre-existing right more generally. Right, the takings clause might well have been enacted for the immediate purpose of uh, dealing with the people whose horses and other supplies were taken for military confiscations during the Revolutionary War, but it enacted a pre-existing right, the right to have compensation when your property was taken that is not limited to horses or military takings or anything like that. <coughs> okay, so far so good. Uh, interestingly, uh, it also relies several times on another footnote that I think is not very famous and may never become very famous, uh, Konigsberg, Konigsberg footnote 10, um, which is a First Amendment case that discusses the categorical exceptions to First Amendment coverage that we talked about on the first panel. 
uh, where the court explained why it was rejecting the absolutist approach to the First Amendment, that no law shall make no law, where the court said, the absolutist view, of course, cannot be reconciled with the law relating to libel, slander, misrepresentation, obscenity, perjury, false advertising, et cetera, et cetera, because, as Mr. Justice Holmes once said, the provisions of the Constitution are not mathematical formulas. They are living institutions transplanted from English soil. Their significance is vital, not formal. It is to be gathered, not simply by taking the words in a dictionary, but by considering their origin and their line of growth. And then it specifically notes that the Second Amendment uh, works similarly. Now, <clears throat> apart from the kind of biological metaphors, uh, part of what the court is trying to say here is that the First and Second Amendment are incorporate the common law. So to figure out what their meaning is, you don't just parse the public meaning of the words, you try to figure out what was the doctrine they came from, where did, the, where did it come from, and how has it been lawfully changed? The origin and the line of their growth. So far, so good again. Uh, I also have to note that the opinion in Bruin for the first time uh, endorses the idea that the court's job is to find, quote, our founder's law, unquote, and that uh, the quest for our founder's law is important because that determines what is, quote unquote, our law, which again, I think is the right way to think about it. I'm pleased to see the Supreme Court acknowledge that. Then we get to the hard part, the question of application. <coughs> uh, and as I'm sure people who've read Bruin know or remember, the court then tries to, to walk this sort of strange line where it says, you know, again, the Constitution's meaning is fixed according to the understanding of those who ratified it, but the Constitution can and must apply to circumstances beyond those the founders specifically anticipated. Of course, arms includes stun guns and not just muskets. Uh, property in the takings clause includes railroads and cell phones and other things that didn't exist at the time of the founding. You have to figure out what the original category is uh, and extend it to new, to new entrants, not just limit it to the original, to the original category. And much like we use history to determine which modern arms are protected by the Second Amendment, so too does history guide our consideration of modern regulations that were unimaginable to founding. When confronting such present-day firearm regulations, this historical inquiry that courts must conduct will often involve reasoning by analogy, a commonplace task for any lawyer or judge. <clears throat> This is the part that everybody finds extremely confusing, right? How are we supposed to reason by analogy? How do we figure out, you know, what the banning of carrying of arms by uh, Catholics or slaves or whoever has to do with the question of regulating high capacity magazines or ghost guns or whatever today? And here, in some ways, the court makes it worse by admitting to us how hard the problem is. The court then cites several uh, current law professors on the difficulty of analogical reasoning. <clears throat> it cites Cass Sunstein to note that, you know, figuring out what is analogous to what uh, is hard because you have to figure out whether it's relevantly similar. And the question is, what is relevant? Because everything is similar in infinite ways to everything else, one needs some metric enabling the analogizer to assess which similarities are important and which are not. For instance, a green truck and a green hat are relatively similar if one's metric is things that are green, what color are they? But they are not relevantly similar if the applicable metric is things you can wear, where can you put them? Right, so this is true as well. <clears throat> this is the stuff of sort of 1L legal reasoning of how do you extrapolate from one case to another? This case was decided on a Tuesday, but this transaction takes place on a Wednesday. Is that a relevant distinction or not? Hopefully these are things people still learn uh, during the 1L curriculum about the, the need to reason from one case to another by analogy. <clears throat> the court goes on. To be clear, analogical reasoning under the Second Amendment is neither a regulatory straitjacket nor a regulatory blank check. On the one hand, courts should not uphold every modern law uh, <coughs> that remotely resembles a historical analog. On the other hand, analogical reasoning requires only an analog, not a historical twin. So even if a modern day regulation is not a dead ringer for historical precursors, it still may be analogous enough to pass constitutional muster. We see no reason why judges frequently tasked with answering historical and analogical questions cannot do the same for Second Amendment claims. So here's my claim, is what Justice Thomas means, what he's saying we should do, is just apply common law reasoning to the original common law that is protected by the First and Second Amendments. These were common law rights. <clears throat> to figure out what a common law right is, you look at the cases, you try to extrapolate the general principle the general underlying common law principle from a series of holdings, and then you try to apply that principle and extend it and even modify it as necessary, but not too much, uh, to new facts. 
<laughs> That's the ordinary Langdellian common law method. All of the references to analogies and the problems of analogies are just references to the problems of the, the first year curriculum and the, uh, from no vehicles in the park to cases decided on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And all Justice Thomas is doing is trying to break down for us those basic steps of the, of the common law analogy to remind us that that's, that's the kind of thing we ought to be doing. Um, so I think there were some references on earlier panels to maybe the court has done this in the First Amendment context. I think this is the kind of thing Justice Thomas is telling us to do in the Second Amendment context. And that makes a special sense when you're dealing with pre-existing rights that were themselves defined by common law. Justice Thomas is just asking us to use the original methods of common law reasoning that existed for centuries to the rights that continue to be protected by the Constitution. <coughs> this should be uh, a breath of fresh air, I would hope, in a world of confusing and strange methodological approaches. Now, why can't Justice Thomas say all this rather than talk about analogies and twins and dead bang ringers and on the one hand, on the other hand? <coughs> the reason is because we have forgotten what the common law method was. Uh, in the world we now live, the common law method, and especially common law constitutionalism, is often taken to just mean something like judge-made law according to whatever the judges want to and think they can get away with. And so if Justice Thomas were to say, you should just do common law constitutionalism in this area, we might think that he was referring to the work of my colleague David Strauss rather than the work of some of my predecessors in office, like uh, Professor Ed Levy or Professor Carl Llewellyn, or others who worked on the, the earlier forms of the common law. <laughs> in other words, we have so lost the Langdellian version of the common law, uh, thanks to legal realism and law and economics and reforms in the first year curriculum and more, that Justice Thomas can no longer even refer to it by its name or in a simple way. He has to sort of try to, to reinvent it for us, like the, the game of taboo, where you have to explain some core concept without being able to use any of the five most relevant words to explaining that concept. That's basically what he's tried to do for common law reasoning for pre-existing common law rights. Uh, <clears throat> I'd note that you know, another part of the problem Justice Thomas faces would be uh, former Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, in his work on textual interpretation, a matter of interpretation, Justice Scalia very much adopts this new and, and mistaken, I think, view of the common law method. Justice, Thomas ex Justice Scalia sorry, explains that the reason we ought to engage in the kind of textualism he describes is because the only alternative is the kind of common law, uh, common law method, which just means uh, law developed by the judges without any constraint by custom or the constraint by common law reasoning and the like. Justice Scalia was himself essentially a, a, a modern realist about how the common law worked, which is what led him to become such a strong textualist. Uh, which means we now have to reinvent some new vocabulary for the real kind of common law to make sense of the common law rights protected by the Constitution, which of course the text of the Constitution tells us to do. All right. <clears throat> In other words, I think Bruin makes a lot of sense. Now, one problem, additional problem, is that lower courts may not be getting the message. Uh, many lower courts have taken Bruin's analogical reasoning in uh, strange and I think mistaken directions. Uh, one example this mentioned at the previous panel is the Fifth Circuit's decision in Rahimi, I think Joseph mentioned this, uh, where the Fifth Circuit faced a facial challenge to a statute, 18 U.S.C. 922 G, that makes it unlawful for any person who is subject to a court order, uh, a domestic violence restraining order, uh, that either is based on a finding that they are a threat to safety or explicitly prohibits the use of firearms from protecting a gun, and the Fifth Circuit said, this statute is unconstitutional because while there are various historical analogs, you know, none of them seem to us to be sufficiently close uh, to uphold it. Uh, I think this is a sign of Bruin's methodology gone wrong. And so, of course, it's a good criticism of the court that if it can't describe its methodology in terms simple enough to be applied by lower court judges, it's going to need to try again. Uh, my hope is that this case will present an occasion for the court to do so again. The Solicitor General has filed a petition for certiorari in Rahimi. Uh, my hope is that we'll go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will use this occasion to explain what, what it is they require, not a close parsing of you know, exact statutes, but common law reasoning, where you look at the kinds of things that were traditionally allowed to be regulations on the right, you ask what principle united those things, and then you apply that principle to new facts. And when you do that, I think you discover, as uh, Justice Barrett wrote when she was in the Seventh Circuit, 
that history is consistent with common sense, and it demonstrates that legislators have the power to prohibit dangerous people from possessing guns. Now, <clears throat> if you get into the details about Rahimi itself, we may have to parse the statute apart. So the part of the statute that uh, applies to restraining orders where there's been a finding that the person is dangerous should clearly be upheld under Bruin's methodology. The part of Rahimi that applies to all domestic violence restraining orders, even if there's not been a finding of dangerousness, would be harder to sustain. I don't know that the court will have to parse things that closely because it's a facial challenge, and I hope we don't get too hung up on the details. Uh, but my hope is that this will pr present an occasion for the court to sort of consolidate and con condense Bruin into uh, explaining the, the kind of commonsensical thing it's requiring us to do. All right, two more things. So I, I recognize that often I am in the role of trying to sympathetically reconstruct what the Supreme Court is doing. Uh, <clears throat> And I don't want to be accused of, of glossing over too many of the hard problems. So let me just mention two of them and talk about one of them. So one of the hard problems is what I would call the problem of politics, the problem of politicization. Uh, obviously, this kind of method can be used to just, uh, even if that's not what you're supposed to be doing, to implement the judge's own preferred political preferences. It can be a vehicle for the politicization of constitutional law. I think this is a huge problem, and I don't think the Supreme Court is immune from it. But I'm just going to bracket it for three reasons. First, it's not the topic of our conference, and I'm hoping to secure a return invitation to next year's conference, Law and What Kind of Politics. <laughs> Two, the problem, while the Supreme Court is not immune from it, stretches far beyond the Supreme Court and includes not just other judges, but those who uh, report on the court, academics who write about the court, much of our discourse about the court's role in American society. And I think it's hard to separate uh, concerns about the politicization of the Supreme Court from the complicity of many of the rest of us in politicizing it. Third, I just really don't know what to do about it. Okay. <clears throat> the other problem, which I will talk about for a few more minutes, is what I'd call the problem of selectivity. Uh, when does the court engage in this kind of historical reasoning where it sort of returns to first principles? When does it uh, engage in a more surface level kind of historical reasoning where it just follows the existing doctrine and the existing precedent without worrying too hard about where it came from, what its historical warrant is? Uh, how does it decide to, to do one of those or the other? This has given rise to the fair accusation that in many ways the court's originalists are you know, faint-hearted originalists or selective originalists or manipulative originalists or various other epithets. Um, I think the best statement of this model is what uh, Richard Ray has called precedent as permission. As it currently operates, uh, you can, the justices can never really be criticized for following precedent, even though they have the option of overruling precedent. So they kind of have two choices in, in almost every case, return to first principles or not. Uh, and that kind, embedding that kind of uh, discretion in an era of constitutional law that's been trying to resist and constrain discretion does create a real problem that really will need to be addressed. Now, I do think the court is working on this. Some of the justices have started to develop uh, more rigorous theories of precedent and stare decisis. Justice Thomas has put forth the view that whenever a precedent is shown to be clearly erroneous, the court is required to overturn it. It doesn't have the discretion to keep it around just because it, it likes it anyway. Um, but even Justice Thomas has built in the escape hatch of certiorari. Uh, the court is always required to overturn it if it decides to consider whether to overturn it. But, you know, they could decide not to consider whether to overturn it. Uh, Professor Amy Barrett, when she was on, uh, before she was a judge, wrote about the same thing, indeed as a defense of originalism, that originalism might well require an honest originalist to overturn the legal tender cases if the question were ever asked, but don't worry, because originalist justices will just make sure the question is never asked. Um, I worry about this a lot, uh, and I'm actually not sure it's consistent with the original understanding of the judge's bill or the original understanding of the doctrine of certiorari, which I think probably had uh, more robust limits on judicial discretion. Uh, and I question the ability of judges to, to use their discretion not to ask the question as a way to get around answering questions they don't like. Um, but that's something that'll require, that'll require future work. Uh, <clears throat> and other justices are still working on their theories of stare decisis as well. But I view this as a promising development because it's put the conversation in the right place on, an, again, a legal question. What is the law of precedent 
what kind, when are precedents required to be overruled, when must they be retained, what amount of discretion can we have here, how do we understand legal discretion in this area. These are not exactly originalist questions, but they're deeply legal questions, and they might even be questions that could be usefully answered by reference to founding law, by better understanding the founding era principles of precedent uh, and, dare I say, liquidation, uh, and so on. <coughs> what I will say is this. Uh, if you think of originalism as only public meaning originalism, this problem is, is even worse, right? It's hard to say anything about the current problem of precedent and selectivity other than, well, stare decisis is just a pragmatic exception to originalism. And indeed, it looks like the Supreme Court makes pragmatic exceptions to originalism, you know, more often than not. That's Professor Fallon's charge in his recent article on selective originalism. But if you think of originalism as original law originalism, as you say, our law is the founder's law as it's lawfully changed, then you say, well, relying on precedent is not an exception to originalism. Precedent is a well-established legal doctrine that judges consider in appropriate cases. And if the doctrine of precedent is currently a little too woolly or discretionary or out of joint, then further legal reasoning about what our law of precedent should look like and what legal principles we can use will be the way to solve it. So original law originalism both better describes the biggest problem the court faces and better describes the resources that it has to solve that problem. Now, whether it's up to the task of solving the problem, I hope to report back on soon, uh, but that's all I have for now. Thank you. I think they have a microphone here for questions if people want to ask them. Hey, Will, uh, Daryl Miller, uh, Duke Law School. Great presentation, as always. Um, one of the questions I have is about uh, the escape hatch, the certiorari escape hatch, which that will only work so far as the lower courts get the signal. If they think that you know uh, there's a revolution afoot and they need to be part of the revolution, or if they read a case like Gamble, for example, and say, my obligation is to the original public meaning or originalism and not to precedent and therefore I'm going to, uh, you know, overrule um, on some grounds some settled precedent or distinguish it away in, in a way that seems um, tangent tendentious, then doesn't that force the hand of the Supreme Court that they end up having to uh, decide the question that they would otherwise be able to avoid through the certiorari process? Uh, yes, and this is exactly right. So, you know, you might think that, uh, well, the Supreme Court's tried to get around this problem by announcing a rule that lower courts are never allowed to overrule Supreme Court decisions until the Supreme Court says the magic words, this decision is hereby overruled. Uh, even if it's obvious that the revolution is afoot, right? You're supposed to wait until the head of the re revolution actually blows the horn uh, before you storm the gates. Now, that doesn't totally solve the problem of you know, intense distinguishing of precedents uh, with similar effect and there's nothing to make sure lower courts follow this rule either, other than the possibility of Supreme Court reversal. But often that, that's been enough to keep the lower courts from, from pushing things too far. That said, uh, this is where I want to distinguish a little bit between the Supreme Court's problems and our problems. So it's true, from the Supreme Court's point of view, the Fifth Circuit is a big problem. Because the Fifth Circuit regularly wants to force the Supreme Court to confront questions that the Supreme Court would much rather ignore, right? But maybe from, from the broader point of view, that's not a terrible thing. That's actually a useful constraint on the Supreme Court's ability to just uh, avoid, avoid settling the law, take slightly incomprehensible or unprincipled positions and hope nobody ever pushes them on the details. You know, maybe indirectly for us, the ability of some lower court judges to, to force the question will help keep the court uh, working hard on this rather than just uh, giving up. Hi, I just wanted to ask about your kind of common law analogy reasoning. Um, you know, common law state supreme courts in the 1800s would routinely overrule essential elements of common law rights and fundamentally alter the right. So is your view of that, you know, codifying a pre-existing right and common law reasoning from then incorporate overruling those even essential elements as a common law court would have? And if so, 
I'm just not sure I understand the distinction you're making between your view and the kind of common law constitutionalism of your colleague Strauss that you mentioned. Great. Uh, okay, so it's absolutely right that the common law has always contained a certain kind of change, including overruling cases. Uh, one of my more unwieldy research projects is cataloging as many examples of uh, 19th century common law overruling cases as possible, see exactly how they work, uh, and I have not found them all yet. But the most striking thing I found is that uh, none of them look like late 20th and 21st century overrulings often do. So today, it's not at all unusual for a court to just say something like, you know, this rule has been around for a long time, but we no longer like it, and we're going to get rid of it. Uh, New Mexico abolished the spousal privilege uh, just by Supreme Court decree on the basis of their view about whether it could still, still be around. Instead, the courts would, would sort of often rely on the more underlying principles of the common law. They'd say, you know, we've always had this principle that, of whatever, previously our cases have implemented this principle in this way, but now we see, based on changed circumstances, that this is a better way to implement them. Sometimes they would say, you know, this principle made sense in the institutional and geographic environment of England, but no longer here. So one of my favorite opinions I teach uh, to first years is the Supreme Court's opinion in the Genesee Chief, where it uh, changes the common law scope of admiralty jurisdiction which previously had been thought to run with the tides as a way of sort of describing the boundary between the ocean and, and the areas it didn't reach. Uh, but in the, Supreme Court, in, in the Supreme Court, the court concludes that it should be different. It should include all navigable waters, not just running with the tides. Why? Not because the common law principles have changed and we want more admiralty exactly, but because the, the tides formulation made sense in England where they didn't have large freshwater lakes like we do, and they didn't have steamboats that could go up the Thames to reach them, even if they did. So to them, explains the court, go, running with the tides was just a description of the navigable waters, but now we realize, you know, we, we have some navigable waters that don't run with the tides, and we need to redescribe the rule to be able to encompass them. Now, of course, there's a certain amount of creativity, discretion, judgment, no doubt politics, in making those choices, but all I'll say now is that it's a very different way of describing the change than what 21st century courts do now when they change the common law, and I think one that's probably psychologically relevant, that like trying to think about common law change in those terms is a little more disciplining uh, and certainly calls upon different disciplines than the way that modern courts do when they change the common law. <laughs> Having some short person problems. Um, thanks for your presentation, Will. <laughs> My question is just, is there really as big of a distinction between original meaning or public meaning originalists um, and your view as you suggest? Uh, I mean, certainly there might be differences between how Randy and Larry are presenting some of their views and how you are, but isn't it possible that, say, a justice could say, I'm a you know, public meaning originalist, and it's important to me to understand what some of the unwritten laws were because that's part of original meaning, and in fact, the original meaning of Article Three powers for judges may have included something like liquidation and uh, an understanding of precedent, which is also part of the original meaning of the constitutional law. And so therefore you can you know, just view that as part of sort of just substituting, you're saying, well, what's our original law? And they're saying, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And what is the original meaning of the law? Can't those two, I guess, be more friendly bedfellows than you suggest, maybe? Uh, I hope so. Uh... I, again, I, I don't have a lot at stake in trying to, to cast anybody out of the originalist tent. And I think, yes, you could say, when I understand the original meaning of a term, of course that includes all of the surrounding context, including all the surrounding legal rules for how we understand those terms. And maybe you find words in the Constitution that further clue you that's, that's permissible. I think that's, I think that's fine. Uh, I, I do worry people sometimes uh, think they're doing something wrong when they do that or you know, worry that they're sort of cheating a little bit by looking at too much law and not enough text. But as long as they, they don't have that worry, uh, I'm happy to, happy to call it whatever. Yeah, no, no, yeah, thank you very much. I guess one question I have, right, is uh, when you mention um, the unwritten law or the fact that you know, common law sort of represents a sort of tradition of unwritten law, are there principles about the sorts of principles that judges can or cannot be allowed to abstract from there? Or what, what is it that keeps the judges from using their, their, their reason of what they think the unwritten law is in the sort of natural law sense? Okay. Uh, I guess there's, 
there's two ways to answer this. So one is sort of internally, right? How is the common law supposed to work, right? And I think it actually is true. The common law does contain a certain amount of normative reasoning, right? There are debates about how much. Uh, the famous debate between Iredell and Chase and Calder versus Bull is about how much do natural law principles inform positive law and how much should judges take account of those. Uh, you know, those are those are sort of internal to the law debates. Um, but but the answer is the normative reasoning is part. We don't want it to be too much, and the, there are a lot of precedents to sort of try to settle how that works. There's an external way of asking that question, though, which is like, what is to stop a judge from using the cover of common law reasoning to do whatever they want to do anyway, right? That's the problem I said I have no good solution to. Um, maybe nothing. Uh, maybe nothing stops a judge who really wants to cheat from cheating. I'm not sure that's different for this methodology than any other methodology, uh, or even worse for this methodology than any other methodology. Uh, I'm not sure we've invented the technology yet that can sort of uh, implant itself on the brain of a wayward judge and constrain them to be a good judge. Uh, and it might have side effects if we did. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bode. Uh, my question is about um, role of normal legislation and how it inter interacts with um, sort of common law reasoning process by judges. Um, so I'm, what I'm wondering is, uh, it sounds like that's basically what was happening in Britain and then we adopt that common law approach. But what's, I'm, I'm, I'm highly kind of very, very I, I'm, I'm very inclined to think that at the, by adopting the written constitution, we are trying to do something quite different from what Britain what British people were doing, um, and isn't it in some ways, you know, these um, changes of laws, and you know, even if that means you're discovering natural law, maybe through legislation, not necessarily through the judiciary. Well, I'm just kind of curious about that aspect. In what sense are we doing something different from Britain? Uh, yeah. oh, so, in having a sort of written, entrenched, fixed constitution. We're obviously making a huge innovation on British constitutional law, which you know is sometimes written and drawn from statutes, but not in the sense of having a single entrenched fixed document. And that's a huge innovation. Um, we should never lose sight of that. But it would be a mistake to think that we therefore got rid of all aspects of the common law, unwritten law tradition. What we did is drop on top of those aspects a piece of written supreme law that now controls everything. That has a huge effect on how the system works. But it still, to be understood correctly, draws on some of the unwritten law beneath it to understand the meaning of its terms, to understand even questions about how to interpret it. Uh, and that happens from the very beginning. Some of the arguments that Jonathan Keenapp and I are having yesterday are sort of related to this. Like everybody knows there's still an unwritten law of the Constitution uh, as well, even if the written Constitution now, you know, is now a new artifact on top of that. Ah, thanks for your uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to ask about the concept of liquidation. Now, when you brought up the fact that the Supreme Court might not appreciate some of the cases sent up from the Fifth District, is that not kind of part of the process that gets to be known as liquidation, is the subsequent unfolding of other actors on the law in its implementation? Uh, no, I think it very much is. So that's, I very much hope that, that you know, Bruin will not be the court's last word on either the Second Amendment or the analogical reasoning method, and that they'll be forced to, to liquidate it a little more specifically about what they mean. Um, and again, I think that from the point of view of the country and the law, that'll be a good thing. Uh, from the point of view of the Supreme Court, I'm sure that will be very annoying and a lot of work. Uh, having just f fought over that case, they'll be annoyed to have to return to it so quickly. Um, but they do work for us. Thank you. Hi, my question about uh, originalism is that this idea of we the people has had such a fundamentalist shift that constitutional interpretation, even originalism, even using common law, um, just doesn't address these notions now of we the people. For example, uh, Justice Thomas has called into question Loving versus Virginia, whether that was rightly decided. He thinks that states should have a right to make a decision there and, and agree or disagree with this. I'd like to ask you, how would you interpret, how would you have analyzed that case uh, in 1964, not now, 
as a constitutionalist, because here's my concern. What I think it was Cass Sunstein or some others made the argument here uh, at a previous discussion that there are notions of custom and that people, th that issues become accepted. And so that's how you can get, that you would not overturn loving. But the way that happens, I think, is a judge, an activist judge, makes a decision because the notion of we the people has changed. They rule and enter uh, bans on interracial marriage as unconstitutional. And eventually, people get used to interracial marriage. Children don't have tails and all that kind of stuff. And so then loving becomes settled. But how do you get to that when you have an issue quintessentially that the founding fathers could not have anticipated? They would have banned, right? So how do you analyze an American issue like that with an originalist lens? Okay. So I hate to fight the hypo, but I will. Uh, yeah, so, so I'll just say, so I, th I do think loving, it turns out, um, is a slightly easier case. So there's an article by David Upham on inter interracial marriage and the original meaning of the Privileges and Immunities Clause that details pretty convincingly, I think, that marriage was understood to be one of the privileges or immunities of citizens, and bans on interracial marriage were seen as a sort of exception to the rule, that they were not something that just went without saying in a statement of the right, but they were a kind of a form of regulation that didn't exist uh, before. And shortly after the 14th Amendment, there's a split among courts about interracial marriage bans. It's not unthinkable. Um, there are judges on both sides, and uh, it actually ends up being pretty much a partisan divide, where every Republican judge finds interracial marriage bans unconstitutional, every Democratic judge finds them constitutional. Uh, that doesn't mean there's a clear answer, but at least that's a sign. That's, that's I think, a pretty plausible understanding of the, of the 14th Amendment. But the general point, right, which we could do with Brown or whatever, definitely holds, right, that uh, <clears throat> our law, our common law, and our constitutional law is not good enough uh, in lots of ways uh, and needs to be improved. Uh, my view is that there are channels for lawfully changing it, constitutional amendments, uh, legislation doesn't, don't change the meaning of the Constitution, but can give us lots of rights we didn't have before. Common law evolution can change too. And the, those are all part of our legal system. And that the pro and con of law is that it stops things from changing as fast as some people want uh, in exchange for stopping other things from changing as fast as we don't want them to change. I don't even know that we've got it right, but I do think that's the system we have. Great talk. So I'm just trying to figure out where you differ from Straussian common law constitutionalism. I assume one point is that he'd be willing to use the method more broadly, whereas you want a threshold showing that the provision at issue actually incorporates a common law right. But when it comes to those provisions, Second Amendment or otherwise, could you give examples of types of argumentative moves that you're pretty confident Strauss would bless that you would disapprove of? Uh, sure. Right. So I, I, right. I do think there's just a a background question that's that's very different of sort of, uh, he starts with the common law rather than starting with the text. Um, but so one of the things, I guess I'll, I'll say two things. So one is that uh, in his book on the living constitutionalism, uh, David, who's one of my favorite colleagues, uh, he endorses as his version of the common law, uh, Judge Cardozo's famous opinion in McPherson versus Buick, where the court overrules uh, quite deliberately and willfully uh, centuries of common law doctrine on the privity rule to create something new, what they think is a, is a better way of seeing everything. He says, this is, the, this is the quintessential common law method. This is what I mean by common law constitutionalism. And that's like the quintessential modern common law method uh, rather than the quintessential uh, classical common law method. So not Cardozo would be a, a good way to start. Uh, the other thing he says explicitly is that the common law method will involve judges making their own moral ca moral decisions uh, in big cases. Like most of the time you should move incrementally, most of the time you should sort of go step by step, but when there's a big moral decision and you know the right thing to do, you should just do it. Um, which I think describes how a lot of judges think of the role, but I think is not part of the classical uh, legal method. Okay, Andy, you're last. So uh, I mean, I go back to the problem that everything is analogous to everything else. Uh, 
And so that means that if the earlier precedent uh, has some characteristic that I want to make salient, I can introduce into the law something based on the earlier decision that, you know, they didn't really dwell on this, but the early decision was in fact made on a Tuesday. And so now you know, we're going to say that, you know, just following the guidance of the earlier decision, Tuesday is crucial. Um, and to make a particular, your example of uh, you know, the domestic abuser case, uh, I say, well, it you know, matters whether they've been adjudicated to be dangerous. Uh, suppose that we had data that showed that that subset of people who are under a restraining order who have not been adjudicated to be dangerous, that you know, we've got good data that indicates that that set of people are really dangerous, commit homicides far more frequently than uh, the rest of the population then you know, it depends on what you construe the relevant reasons are for constraining arms. You can easily see how the decision could go either way. Uh, yeah, again, I, I think this is a decision where there really is no plausible path to uh, facially invalidate the statute, because I think even the part of the statute that says people who've been found to be dangerous is actually directly analogous to some references in Blackstone of the power of a of a justice of the peace to respond to the complaint of a wife of the dangerousness of her husband in uh, chapter 18 of book four on preventing crimes. But I don't think you should need to go there. So um, I guess this, the funny thing is uh, we all know the joke that this case was decided on a Tuesday, but this is a Wednesday. But we all know it's a joke. Um, no, so I've not found any case where a court has in, actually with a straight face distinguished a case that way. They all know that's not a permissible move. Um, which is a sign that there's at least still something like thinking like a lawyer, that lawyers have not totally lost. Now, maybe there's not enough of that, uh, and maybe we have too many jokes in the law, and that's part of our job as law professors, is to uh, try to be a little more serious about the whole thing, which is kind of my project. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Will.